Hi, my name is Sandy Simpson, and um, I want to deal with a subject today uh, from an article that I wrote called Universalism in the World Has Permeated the Church. The current fad of interfaith solidarity and unity is simply a thin guise of what is called inclusivism, universalism, and pluralism. Universalism, as defined by dictionary.com, uh, is this, the doctrine that emphasizes the universal fatherhood of God and the final salvation of all souls. Also from uh, Wikipedia, universalism is a religion and theology that generally holds all persons and cre creatures are related to God or the divine and will be reconciled to God. Plural pluralism is similar uh, and is defined this way, the doctrine that reality is composed of many ultimate substances, the belief that no single explanatory system or view of reality can uh, account for all the phenomenon of life. And inclusivism. Inclusivism posits that even though the work of Christ is the only means of salvation, it does not follow that explicit knowledge of Christ is necessary in order for one to be saved. Hmm, how does that work? In contrast to pluralism, inclusivism agrees that Exclusivism in affirming the particularity of uh, salvation in Jesus Christ, but unlike exclusivism, inclusivism holds that an implicit faith response to general revelation can be salvific. God expects from a man a response proportional to the light given. Saving faith is not characterized so much by its cognitive uh, content as by its rev reverent quality. Well, you know, we're going to deal with these old heresies brought forward to modernity and these ideas that all men have a relationship with God that will cause them to be able to avoid judgment. And we deal with that in the book that I wrote with Mike Oppenheimer on the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People movement called Idolatry in Their Hearts. The idea that all men who worship a God or supreme being are worshiping the true God, YHWH, has bubbled up to the very top of our societies and religion, and even Christendom, and should sound a warning alarm to true biblical Christianity. Instead, as usual in our day, most Christians are asleep at the wheel, while universalists claim that you can pray to a God like, oh, let's say, Allah, and be praying to the true triune God, YHWH. And I also dealt with the fact that Allah is not YHWH, both in that book and also in the article I wrote called, Is Allah the Same as YHWH? Now, let's look at uh, one of our presidents, past presidents, George Bush, a professing Christian, who unfortunately was led astray by false teachers and heretical counselors such as T.D. Jakes and Ted Haggard. And he came out with the following statements in interviews. Now, I'm not playing politics here, as politicians from both sides of the aisle are making these kinds of statements these days, and in particular the liberals, and Barack Obama has said the same kind of things. But let's look at what George Bush said. I believe that all the world, whether they be Muslim, Christian, or any other religion, prays to the same God. That's what I believe. See, I believe there's a universal God, I believe the God that the Muslims pray to is the same God that I pray to. After all, we all came from Abraham. I believe in that universality. He also said this, Americans of many faiths and traditions share a common belief that God hears the prayers of his children and shows grace to those who seek him. There's a power in these prayers to various gods, of course. I ask the uh, citizens of our nation to give thanks, each according to his or her own faith for the freedoms and blessings we have received, and for God's continued, continued guidance, comfort, and protection. Oh, is that going to work? President Bush also hosted an Islamic celebration at the White House, uh, and he welcomed his guests with these words. Laura and I have, are pleased to have you here for our seventh iftar dinner. Tonight, we celebrate the traditions of Islamic faith, which brings hope and comfort to more than a billion people. For Muslims around the world, the holy month of Ramadan is a time to celebrate Islam's learned and vibrant culture, 
which has enriched civilization for centuries. Ramadan is also a good time for Americans of all faiths to reflect on the values we hold in common, including love of family and gratitude to the Almighty. Islam is bringing hope and comfort? What world do these guys live in? Certainly not the world where there are over a hundred wars going on in various places and all but one of them is, is uh, uh, involving Muslims. Has enriched civilization for centuries? More like they have attacked civilizations of the world since its inception, since, since Islam began. But Bush is not the only Christian making these kinds of statements. Of course, we expect universalism in the world, and we know that the United Religions Initiative of the uh, United Nations, which Bush supports, is promoting universalism. Let's look at what they say. We believe that the wisdom of our religious and spiritual traditions should be shared for the health and well-being of all. Therefore, as communities of faith and interdependent people rooted in our faith, we now unite for the sake of peace and healing among nations, peoples, and nations, and for the benefit of the earth and all things. We believe that all religions derive their wisdom from the ultimate source. Therefore, the world's faith traditions share in common wisdom, which can be obscured by differences in religious concepts and practices. The United Religious uh, religions promotes dialogue. A theology of acceptance will help the world's people explore common ground. Our awareness of unity within religious diversity promotes ever-increasing kinship. Oh, really? Is that what we see going on in the world? We also know that false religions like Baha'i have been promoting universalism for years when they're actually trying to get people to worship Baha'u'llah. They say this, many names and many religions are used to describe the same God. Be aware that all major religions promote the belief in one God and one mankind, and that God is the source of truth and guidance. In other words, God creates all religions. The source of all religions is one. Truth is one. God is one. Sound familiar? They also say this, although we have... Uh, Although we may have different concepts of God's nature, although we may pray to Him in different languages and call Him by different names, Allah or Yahweh, God or Brahma, nevertheless, we are speaking about the same unique being. Now, it also looks like the coming Maitreya, who is the Antichrist, will be revealed using this same universalist mantra. Let's look at what uh, Benjamin Cream supposedly got a message from Maitreya, what he said. According to esoteric teachings, Maitreya is the awaited fifth Bra uh, Buddha. He's also known as the Christ, world teacher, Imam Mahdi, Messiah, and Kalki of Avatar. The word Christ is not the same, the name of an individual, but the title of an office or function within the spiritual hierarchy of masters. Oh, really? The leader of all the masters for our planet's spiritual hierarchy is known to many in the West as the Christ and as Bodhavista in the East. The hierarchy is known to some as the Great White Brotherhood. Without infringing upon our free will, Maitreya and his disciples, the masters of wisdom, will guide humanity into a future which will be much lovelier uh, than most of our uh, better futurists uh, currently imagine. Preferring to be known simply as the teacher, Maitreya has not come as a religious leader or to found a new religion, but as teacher and guide for people of every religion and those of no religion. He's come like a thief in the night. And, he, and they quote Peter uh, 3, <laughs> 3.10. And he said he comes when he's least expected. He's returning for the good of everyone, both the religious and non-religious alike. So they're already setting up this false um, uh, antichrist <clears throat> as Christ. But let's look at universalist statements by other Christians, quote unquote, and Christian organizations. Really? When they make these st statements, they are denying, unfortunately, the core doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 
and thereby they are teaching heresy. Let's look at what Wycliffe of Bible Translation Society said regarding Bible translation. From the outset, one has to deal with identifying the name for the supreme being, God. This can be difficult and potentially divisive. However, each language and culture appears to have within it a homing instinct for God, deeply buried by sin and corruption that affects all cultures yet still there. Hmm. Each religion has a different understanding of deity and is based upon how the supreme being is, is defined. The characteristics of the local deity must be identified so that it can be determined how these will impact the understanding of God. Is it possible for any language to totally explain the meaning of God? Or is there a need to add further definition or explanation? The challenge is to identify that intrinsic capacity exists, what intrinsic capacity exists within the language that helps people uh, uh, and helps provide the meaning of God. I thought the Bible provided the meaning of God. You say, is it possible for any language to totally explain the meaning of God? Well, apparently Hebrew and Greek are fine with God as those are the original languages of the Bible and they explain everything we need to know about God. In fact, since the, uh, since the English and other translations are based on those languages, we have everything we need in the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. Wycliffe and other uh, uh, SBL partners are looking for the names of local deities to put in the Bible for God. That has never been the modus operandi for Bible societies up until the present because local deities are clearly not the true YHWH of Scripture that Christians worship. If these local deities can help provide the meaning of God, then how is it that the Bible clearly states that the Gentiles do not know God? 1 Corinthians 1.20, Galatians 4.8, 2 Thessalonians 1.8 and 9. And that they are without God and without hope in the world, Ephesians 2.11-13. through 13, Apart from the gospel being preached to them, Romans 10.14-15. And yet we have the Society of Biblical Literature, another Bible translation group, saying this, There's an unwarranted skepticism toward the heathen's position, possession, if at all, of a very limited and low knowledge of the divine from the so-called natural native religion. The adoption of a local name for the universal God will facilitate mutual transformation of both Christianity and the na native religion and culture. I'd say it's basically transforming Christianity into something else. Leon Su of Aloha Keakua and the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People movement says this, So these are clues that we felt God had left the Hawaiian people and evidence that he's left as well as processes he's left in which our Hawaiian people can respond in a very natural way to God and really set things right between them and God. Oh! A few years ago, some friends and I were contemplating how we could be able to reach indigenous peoples, and we thought, what was, and we thought that what was prevalent at the time was a misconception among within the church of God's presence here in the islands. The misconceptions that as uh, as was expressed earlier, was that God didn't arrive until the missionaries arrived. You know, and so when we started to look at this, we started to look into our culture and see that things within our culture that God had originally intended for this particular group of people, Hawaiians. Hmm, God didn't arrive till the missionaries arrived? That's simply not the truth. The only way many Hawaiians were saved was by hearing the gospel from missionaries. They had no saving knowledge of God and no way to be reconciled to God, were worshiping a number of false gods, were deep into idolatry and pagan rituals of all kinds, and were imprisoned by the enemy. They may have acknowledged that some god created the universe, but that is only general revelation that there is a god, not specific revelation, that can really set things right between them and God? I don't think so. Terry LeBlanc, an American Indian, uh, actually Canadian, uh, with World Vision Canada, said this, There's a myth 
that we have labored under for centuries in indigenous communities. And the myth is, is that we are godless heathen people. And yet all brings glory to God in its special way. And that's true of human beings and cultures as well. God is now calling forth from among the indigenous communities of the world that good deposit which he's made in them of their cultures, their languages, their musical expressions, and all that sort of thing as an expression of praise and worship to himself. Oh, I see. All the things they're doing are wonderful worship to God. You know what? It's no myth the Gentiles are godless heathen people. It's a biblical fact. Again, Ephesians 2, 11 to 12. The word for heathen or pagans in the Bible, ethnikos, in Greek, and goe in, uh, in Hebrew means Gentiles. And the Bible is not, uh, you know, is not real enthusiastic about the traditions of men. We go on to Richard Twist, another American Indian, president of Wichoni International, now deceased. And he was the keynote speaker at a 2001 conference. He said, the land restitution is the fruit of following traditional indigenous protocol in presenting the redemptive message of faith and hope in Jesus Christ as healer, great spirit, and chief shepherds of all tribes and nations. So he called God the great spirit? Yes, he did. I was watching a 700 Club show, and Gordon Robertson was interviewing Richard Twiss, and he, and he told Gordon that the great spirit of the Indians is the same as the Holy Spirit. And Robertson heartily agreed. The problem with this idea is that the Great Spirit has no son, and without the son, there's no redemption. By the way, the Great Spirit required human sacrifices and other atrocities. And I have articles on this fact. Twist claims that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are the Great Spirit on separate occasions. The Great Spirit is clearly not God if you know about Indian culture. The Great Spirit required a number of pagan rituals, including body mutilation and even uh, suicide. So see this article for more information on that. Daniel Kakawa, head of Aloha Keakua and also involved in the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People, said this, So by finding the native name of God, which in Japan we found that name to be Amanomanakanushi, which means the God in the glorious center of heaven. He's their creator God who created everything. So we found the, this name of this creator God there, and it immediately says he's a Japanese God and he loves them. It, it, he also says it is time that Christians reclaim the many beautiful names of the one creator God in native languages instead of falling into Satan's trap and destroying them. We should reclaim those names and wash the dung of corruption off them instead of giving them to, up to Satan. We must cast off the corruption that Satan has thrown on the many beautiful names of God in, na in native languages. Instead of destroying and ridiculing the native names of the Creator God, we should help uh, preserve them as a legacy for those people. It's their legacy of God's enduring interest, involvement, and care for their culture. Christians should cease representing Jesus as the son of the foreign God of a foreign people, especially if these foreigners had never shown concern for nor had any involvement in the lives or culture of the natives. We should instead introduce Jesus as the son of their creator God. God lovingly created them in the beginning and never left them without a witness. And in his great love for them, even sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die for them. Wow! Well, got some news for you. We deal with this in our book, Idolatry in Their Hearts. Actually, Amanomanakanushi was the god of the pole star in the middle of the sky, not the god in the glorious center of heaven. In other words, they were worshiping the stars. But Amano was also not the highest god of Japan. The highest and oldest were a mother and father combo, again, polytheism, by the name of Izanumi and Izanagi, who then spawned a plethora of other gods, including Amano. Is God a Japanese God? No, God is God. He's YHWH as revealed in the Bible, first to the Jews, by the way. 
But we cannot deny that Jesus Christ was born a Jew into a people called God's people, from which anyone who believes in him as a Gentile is grafted in. Gentile gods had many sons and daughters, but never the one and only true Son of God. Well, now we get into some serious territory. Let's hear some universalist expressions by people we have revered. One of those, unfortunately, is Billy Graham. He said this, They, the heathen, may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think they're saved, and that they're going to be with us in heaven. That was when uh, he was uh, doing an interview. Also, he said the same thing uh, in, in McCall's magazine. I used to think that pagans in far off countries were lost and were going to hell if they did not have the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to them. I no longer believe that. I believe there are other ways of recognizing the existence of God through nature, for instance, and plenty of other opportunities, therefore, of saying yes to God. So Billy Graham reveals himself to be an inclusivist. Now you can read my open letter to Billy Graham that I sent to the BGEA uh, in 2000 and never got a response from. I used to work with the Billy Graham Association in Guam and when I found out that they were uh, inviting Catholics to take people back to the Catholic Church, I quit working with them. Anyway, they never responded to that letter. Somebody else who's a universalist, Rick Warren, talking about Catholics, Methodists, Mormons, Jews, and ordained women, whom he now trains in his seminars. He says, I'm not going to get into a debate over non-essentials. I don't try to change other denominations. Why be divisive, he asks. Citing as his model, Billy Graham, a statesman for Christ, uh, ministering across the barriers. He also said this, God accepts us unconditionally. He also, said, uh, he also cites uh, Henry Nowen, though the quote does not uh, present anything to be uneasy about, he's not a good source to quote. We find Nowen is a promoter of contemplative prayer and is a universalist, basically a new ager. On his website, uh, uh, Warren's website, it says, My wife Kay recommends this book. In it, Nowen divides the life uh, of ministry into five categories, teaching, preaching, pastoral care, organizing, and celebrating. He also, uh, Rick Warren told an interfaith audience at the 2005 UN prayer breakfast that God didn't care what religion they were, they just needed to add Jesus to their lives. What he meant was that you can stay Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, but you need Jesus. It's called the new miss missiology. It promotes the following ideas. Number one, I can keep, you can keep your own religion, Buddhism, Islam, uh, Hinduism, Mormonism. You just need to add Jesus to the equation. Then you become complete. You become a Buddhist with Jesus, a Hindu with Jesus, a Muslim with Jesus, and so on. Number two, you can throw out the term Christianity and still be a follower of Christ. Hmm, how is that possible? Number three, in fact, you can throw out the term Christian too. In some countries, you would be persecuted for calling yourself a Christian, and there's no need for that. Just ask Jesus into your heart. You don't have to identify yourself as a follower of Christ, a Christian. That's Rick Warren. Notice that Warren is teaching uh, church growth techniques to false religions, trying to grow their false religions. Is that helping spread the gospel? The term Christian means follower of Christ. Also, we don't add Jesus to a false religion. We abandon our false religions and believe on him alone. Let's look at what Henry Nowen said. Today, I personally believe that while Jesus came to open the door to God's house, all human beings can walk through that door whether they know about Jesus or not. Today, I see it as my call to help every person claim his or her own his or her own way to God, universalism. That's, this is the guy that Warren endorses. Let's see somebody else who's in this camp, Tony Campolo. On a recent edition of CNN's Crossfire, Tony Campolo refused to say Jesus is the only way to heaven. 
The panel was discussing events at the Southern Baptist Convention in Atlanta. Campolo would not answer the question directly, but said, The Apostle Paul says that there are people who have light that is not Christian light, and they will be judged on that basis. <laughs> in an earlier appearance on PBS's Charlie Rose, Campolo muddied theological waters by saying, I am saying that there is no salvation apart from Jesus. That's my evangelical mindset. However, I am not convinced that Jesus only lives in Christians. He also said, we want to convince the whole human race that there's a God who established the infinite value of every person who mystically dwells in each person. And finally, he said, I do not mean that others represent Jesus for us. I mean that Jesus actually is present in each, other's, in each other person. Jesus is present in everybody? Without believing in Jesus Christ as our Savior and His substitutional death on the cross to pay our penalty of sin, we will be in the great white throne judgment and will be judged by our works. Can our works save us? Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. What Campolo is advocating here is to leave the Gentiles to their own devices. The Holy Spirit only indwells believers. This is absolute false teaching, folks. Let's move on to another organization, YWAM, Youth with a Mission. The Charisma article noted Messianic Muslims, boy, there's an oxymoron if I ever heard one, who continue to read the Quran, visit the mosque, and say their daily prayers, but accept Christ as their Savior, are products of the strategy which is being tried in several countries. A YWAM staff writer wrote, they continue a life of following the Islamic requirements, including mosque attendance, fasting, and Quranic reading, besides getting together as a fellowship of Muslims who acknowledge Christ as a source of God's mercy for them. And that's the, the approach that they're adopting also in India, where a team was working with a Hindu holy man. You know, when you worship in a mosque, you pray to Allah. And Allah is not YHWH. Islam is a quasi-monotheistic religion. But what about Hinduism? They have millions of gods. This is utter ridiculousness. Victor uh, Kazanian uh, Jr., who is an Episcopal priest, said this. He wrote in Episcopal Life Forum, We walk side by side, fellow travelers on life's pathways. I speak of being awakened to the wonder and mystery of the world using words that reflect my window to the divine, the one whom I call my Lord and my God, Jesus, the risen Christ. You too speak of being awakened to the wonder and mystery of the world using words that reflect your window to the divine through the teachings of Buddha, of Baha'u'llah, of Lord Mahavir, of uh, uh, Muhammad, teachings from the Torah, the Guru Ganth, uh, Granth uh, Sahib, and the Vedas. As I hear you speak, and as I look into your eyes, I see God. I feel God. I experience God in you. Not just a partial reflection of my Christian God, but the Creator, the Divine Spirit, in whom uh, we all live and move and have our being. How magnificent is this divine force that it should appear across the earth like the flowers of a garden in so many different shapes and hues. It's not simply so-called religious fundamentalists who practice this exclusivism. No, there's a kind of tolerance of difference preached by liberal church folks, which still clings to Christocentric worldview and becomes apparent when we proclaim our faith using language that devalues the faith of others. There's no place for religious exclusivism in Christianity. It's been arguably the greatest source of human misery during the past two millenniums. It must be replaced by understanding uh, an understanding of the interwovenness of all life, of all religious traditions. I guess he hasn't read that Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Rodney R. Romney, pastor of Seattle's First Baptist Church, he said, He, Jesus, meant to establish a world religion that would embrace every soul and 
synthesize every creed and his work will not be consummated until he has done uh, uh, just that. You know what? Unfortunately, many will follow the broad road to hell. Only a few find the narrow road. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Mother Teresa was another one. She said, I love all religions. If people become better Hindus, better Muslims, better uh, Buddhists by our acts of love, then there's something else growing there. She upheld that there are many ways to God. All is God, Buddhists, Hindus, Christians, etc. All have access to the same God. She said that in Time magazine. Peter Kreeft, professor of philosophy at Boston College, said, We can and should investigate and learn from the wisdom in all other religions. He also said, Allah is not another God, we worship the same God. He said, The same God, the very same God we worship in Christ is the God of the Jews and the Muslims worship. Of course, Robert Schuller was a universalist. We know the things the major face we can agree on. We try to focus on those without offending those different viewpoints or without compromising the integrity of our own Christian commitment. It's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, the Pope. <laughs> Schuller has stated if he came back in a hundred years and found his descendants Muslims, it wouldn't bother him. The Christ spirit dwells in every human being, whether the person knows it or not. Of course, if he, come, if he came back in a hundred years, likely he's going to find his descendants Catholics because that's who he, they sold the uh, Crystal Cathedral to, was a Catholic Church. If the Holy Spirit dwells in every human being, then God is a pantheistic God. Chung Hyung, Chung Hyung Kyung of the World Council of Churches, the leader, she said this, she exalted pagan concepts of God. Of the Holy Spirit, Chung said, don't bother the Spirit by calling her all the time. She's working hard with us. She, hmm. Eighteen times Chung summoned the spirits of the dead who have suffered injustices in the past and claimed that without hearing the cries of these spirits, we cannot hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. After calling on the spirits of the dead, Chung said, I hope the presence of our ancestor spirits here with us will make you uncomfortable. She also summoned the spirit of the earth, air, and water. This is new age. This is uh, necromancy, etc. It's forbidden in scripture, uh, Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 11. And, he tells, and she tells people that they cannot hear the voice of the Holy Spirit without the dead speaking to them. Oh, that's demonism. Pope John Paul II, universalist. He welcomed... Uh, Snake worshippers, fire worshippers, spiritists, animists, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and shamans, uh, and was supported and attended by representatives of the World Council of Churches and even evangelicals. Represented there were the YWCA, YMCA, the Mennonite World Conference, the Baptist World Alliance, which includes the Southern Baptist Convention, the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, and the Lutheran World Federation. I have pictures of, that, pictures of that on my site. Notice that many evangelical, quote-unquote, organizations were present at this meeting. So you can go to this uh, URL to see a picture of Buddha on the altar at a Catholic church in Assisi. And there's also a list, and you can go here to look at who attended also, the New Apostolic Reformation, many of whom are inclusivists. George Otis Jr. of the Sentinel Group in the Transformations video said this, If we accept the premise that Jesus literally purchased, that he literally purchased our salvation with his blood, and he paid the Father, then this approach, first of all, portrays God the Father as being vindictive and bloodthirsty and totally incompatible with biblical forgiveness. <laughs> It also presents another grave difficulty if Jesus literally paid for our sins with his blood and a paid debt is no longer a debt and he died for the sins of the whole world, then we can only come to one conclusion and the theological word for that is universalism, which means that everybody will be saved. You know, Jesus died for the sins of the world and paid the debt of sin. 
but we appropriate that gift to ourselves by repenting and believing. All men will not be saved, only those who believe. We also have most of the emergent church people who are inclusivists and universalists. Brian McLaren, an emerging church leader, said, Jesus seems to say the kingdom of God doesn't need to wait until something else happens. No, it's available and among you now. Invite people of all nations, races, classes, and religions to participate in this network of dynamic, interactive relationships with God and all God's creation. The kingdom of God will rad be radically and scandalously inclusive. As we've seen, Jesus enjoys table fellowship with prostitutes and drunks. He affirms and responds to the faith of Gentiles, Romans and uh, Syrophoenicians and, 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 and Samaritans. He also said universalism is not as bank bankrupt a biblical, uh, of biblical support as some suggest. He also said, but without question, McLaren does, does hold to the doctrine of inclusivism that teaches that while salvation has been made possible by Jesus Christ, it's not necessarily to, necessary to know who Jesus is or the precise nature of what he has done. It may be advisable in many, uh, not all, circumstances to help people become followers of Jesus and remain within their Buddhist, Hindu, or Jewish co contexts. Is our religion the only one that understands the true meaning of life? Or does God place his truth in others too? The gospel is not our gospel, but the gospel of the kingdom of God. And what belongs to the kingdom of God cannot be hijacked by Christianity. God is not inclusive, he's exclusive. Acts 4.12, John 14.6. Jesus even noted that his coming would bring division, Luke 12.51. The division is between those who believe and those who do not. You know what, is our religion the only one that understands the true meaning of life? The answer is yes. No other religion understands God or has the Holy Bible as their guide. The word is truth, John 17, 17. Bishop Spong, the retired bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Newark, he said he's against evangelism and missionary enterprises, the latter being base-born, rejecting, negative, and yes, I would even say evil. This shocking re redefinition of missions as evil is associated with his universalism and epistemology, which we possess neither certainty nor eternal truth, he says. Wow, there's a good missionary. So why bother then? Just let the heathens die in their sins. Reverend James Morton, former dean of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City and founder of the Interfaith Center of New York, Mr. Morton, who described himself as anti-boundaries, urged the audience to be the best Muslim, Jew, Buddhist that you can be, but to explore other religions and cultures as they might explore foreign cuisines. They won't lose their identities, he said, but become richer. Ah, let's just go to the buffet. Just be the best you can, can be. Be the best pagan, the best witch, the best Satan worshiper you can be. John Hicks, former teacher of philosophy at the University of Birmingham, said this, I now no longer find it possible to proceed as a Christian theologian as though Christianity were the only religion in the world. Surely our thinking must be undertaken in, in the one world of today and tomorrow on a more open and global basis. William Shannon, author of Silence on Fire, said, There is a oneness in God that unites all women and men. The goal of all true spirituality is to achieve an awareness of our oneness with God and with all of God's creation. No, <laughs> we must achieve an awareness of our position before God in sin to be a true believer. Alan Jones, author of Reimaging Re Christianity, says the church's fi fixation on the death of Jesus as a universal saving act must end and the place of the cross must be re-imaged in Christian faith. Why? Because of the cult of suffering and the vindictive God behind it. Oh man, I wouldn't want to stand in his shoes on Judgment Day. 
Neil Donald Walsh, who's a Christian New Age author, said this, there's only one message, message that can change the course of human history forever, end the torture, and bring you back to God. And that message is the new gospel. We are all one. He also is famous for saying, there are a thousand paths to God and everyone gets you there. And that's the guy that Robert Schuller loved. Rick Warren also based his peace plan on a similar one of Walsh. William Barkney, uh, Barclay, a Christian Universalist, said, I am convinced, I'm a convinced Universalist. I believe that in the end, all men will be gathered into the love of God. Gregory MacDonald, author of The Evangelical Universalist, he said, can an evangelical be a universalist? In other words, could someone be an evangelical and also believe that one day all people will be saved? If I asked that question of almost any evangelical, I know the answer would be a clear, unequivocal no. So it is with some fear and trepidation that I choose to turn my little fishy nose against the stream and head off in the opposite direction from the majority of my fellow evangelifish. I will suggest that the answer to my opening question is actually yes, it is possible to be, to be an evangelical universalist. Oh, and you would like to be my friend? Question mark. By the way, he didn't turn his nose against the stream. He turned it with the stream. Leonard Sweet, author of Quantum Spirituality, an emergent church leader, said this. He talked about his theory of everything. This theory not only says that all creation is connected, but that it's all inhabited with divinity, God. You know, Leonard Sweet and others such as Dan Kimball are making the circuit of Christian colleges in the U.S. with this type of teaching. And this is clearly pantheism. It's also the first lie of Satan from the Garden of Eden, claiming that we can be little gods. You know, there are many more quotes that I could have added to this article, and I intend to continue to update it as I discover more. Suffice it to say that universalism is taking over the churches through movements like the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People and many leaders in Christianity today. It's simple to put the notion uh, that Jesus Christ is going to save Jews or Gentiles because they pray to some supreme being to, te to, to rest according to Scripture. Those who've never known God have no way to have a relationship with Him and cannot be saved unless the gospel is preached to them. The Bible is clear that Gentiles do not know God, are without God and without hope on their way to eternal destruction, and cannot know God until the gospel is preached to them. Acts 4.12, salvation is found as no one else, where there is no other name under heaven by which, uh, to, given to men by which we must be saved. John 14.6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 1 Corinthians 121, For since the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message priest, preached to save those who believe. Galatians 4.8, And then indeed, when you did not know God, you serve those which by nature are not gods. 2 Thessalonians 1.8-9, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction, and shut out from the presence of God and from the majesty of His power. Apparently these guys have not read their Bible. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13 Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, Excluded, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once uh, were far away have been brought uh, near through the blood of Christ. How then can they call uh, Romans 10, 14 through 15? How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they here, without someone preaching to them. And how can they preach unless they are sent? It is written, How lovely are the feet of those who bring good news.